There's going to be a place for all these exercises depending what area you are at in your overall rehab. If you're looking at performance optimization, then yes, we are probably looking at incorporating a lot more of the exercises on peak muscle force side. If you're in early rehab and do have still have some pain or limitations, then we might need to look other places on the list or incorporate other exercises that are more appropriate. Welcome back to another episode from the Optimal Body Podcast. I'm Dr. Dom. I'm Dr. Jen. And today we're going to be talking about a recent research study that came out talking about the best exercises to get activation in those glutes. So we're going to dive in on the age old, at least social media aged old <laughs> discussion of how do I best get those booty gains <laughs> um, and what exercises are going to get me the most activation or help me grow the glutes the most before we dive in. What do you think about this topic? Is this something that we should even care about? <laughs> Is this something that you're focused on? Comment below. Um, always let us know if you have other topics you want us to touch on. Uh, and hit that subscribe button and notification bell because we have so many of these podcasts and other videos that Jen comes out with, with exercises, mobility flows, all to help you through different pain points and diagnoses. All right. What glute exercises are best if you want to grow your booty? Booty gains. <laughs> booty gains. You know, I really chose this one because one, it is a very recent article that just got released. And because we live in the age of social media of this exercise is best. And if you want booty gains, do this one and like all these different things. Let's, let's just go through what the research is actually finding. And what I think was interesting about this is, you know, they used what is traditionally used, which is an EMG to kind of target what what the reading is for a muscle activation mm -hmm. to say this is the best exercise based on what the EMG says, because it recorded the yeah. best muscle right activation where now they're saying okay but what's the actual peak muscle force of how that is you know relating within the body to actually create the force that we want from that muscle that's actually going to make the largest impact which you would think i mean just like thinking about it emg so if the cuz essentially these emgs are these little sensors that you put on the skin over the muscle mm -hmm. that record the electrical activity coming off of essentially the nerves from the muscle mm -hmm. to say, okay, that's how active this muscle is right now. And when they do research studies, we would see this in physical therapy school and in our program all the time of like the EMG activity for this exercise was best to get rotator cuff activation or mm -hmm. hamstring activation or glute yeah, meat so activation specific muscle. when you're talking about rehabbing certain body areas. And then what researchers would do is say, okay, great. So these exercises are the best when you're doing rehab in this area or trying to get activation of this muscle. But there's been a lot of critiques of that. Like how does EMG activity, it's literally this random electrical activity coming off the muscle. How does that relate to the force production of that muscle during that exercise? And so yeah. that's what this research study looked at. It took how many diff different exercises, 20 or... 18 different How exercises, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 12. 14, 14, 14, 14 different exercises. Who counted right. Yeah. Different exercises and compared the EMG activity to the max muscle peak muscle force production during that exercise. Yeah. And I think what's, you know, when we're look, really looking in the training sense, because we're trying to create increased strength, increased hypertrophy of these muscles, like what is the exercise that I want to be focused on? We'll go through kind of what the research study found and what they said, what some limitations of this research study might be and what we need to consider, but also just what are going to be the heaviest hitters when I'm talking about my glute max and my glute me. So glute max is like the big muscle, the big, huge glute in the very back That's of the our- butt. That's our butt, right? The glute med is along the side. So we talk about glute med strength and stability a lot because it helps us stay upright and forward instead of kicking our hip out to the side too much and getting a lot of lateral movement when we're walking. It keeps us a little bit more supported and upright. In my opinion, and I don't know if you'd agree with this, the glute med is the rotator cuff of the hip. It is. It, it surrounds the hip. It goes kind of front to back. It has actions in both internal, external rotation. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar in what it does for the hip as what 
the rotator cuff does for the shoulder. That is why it is always often a topic of research when it comes to how do we rehab this. And it's often something we're wanting to target when people are rehabbing their hips from pain, rehabbing different gluteal or hip pathologies, even low back pain, you know, training the hips and the glute med can be huge in low back pain. So again, this is, you know, points more towards the importance of, okay, well, when we are in a rehab program, what exercises should we really be working and moving people towards if we're truly wanting to get the most force production out of these muscles? So this was a smaller study. (laughs) They recruited 14 healthy female football players. So I'm assuming this this means soccer in America. Football, (laughs) the European football. Yes. Real football, some would say. (laughs) So. Uh, So young, healthy active women uh, with training backgrounds and each participant performed eight different hip focus exercises. So this was a mix of body weight and loaded drills like eight. There's 14 on the chart. There's 14 on the chart. I recounted. (laughs) But uh, they apparently just tested eight. Well, because I think it's between body weight and, and repetition. So when we're talking body weight versus adding loaded repetition then we get to 14 different exercises but out of those 14 between all of that it was eight different drills including a single leg squat a split squat so just like standing in a lunge position and squatting up and down a single leg romanian deadlift a hip thrust a single leg hip thrust a banded sidestep a hip hike, so the hip hike is where you stand on one foot, like say you're standing on a stair and you just lift your hip up and down. Side steps and single leg, like laying on your side and doing a straight leg raise on the side. And so from this, they collected EMG data from 12 lower limb muscles, including the glute max and the glute med. And here's where it gets interesting because instead of stopping at the EMG, they fed the EMG data, motion capture and ground reaction force data into a neuromusculoskeletal model. And this allowed them to estimate the actual forces of that glute and those muscles to produce during each exercise. And so once they had all of those sets of data from the EMG and the estimated forces, then they ranked the exercises based on, you know, how those kind of matched up. And what they found was, I mean, kind of surprising. I mean, even to me too, face value, it's surprising to me because you would think the EMG activity would correlate more closely with force production. Mm -hmm. But then when I think deeper on it, and I don't, I'm sure that they have standardized procedures. And I did a study, a research study in grad school, PT school, collecting EMG data. So like, I know how to find you're supposed to find the exact point where the nerve junction is and then put the EMG right over that and all this stuff to try and standardize it. But still, like, I can imagine that there's like some variance in how accurate you're get, accurate of data you're getting between researchers or putting the nodes on everybody. Are you hitting the exact right spot? So, But statistically, the correlation ranged from 0.29 to 0.51 five one, which isn't terrible, but it's not nearly strong enough to say that the highest EMG exercise is also the highest force producing exercise. And just when we look at the chart, because they mm-hmm. have this chart, um, the chart's really cool to see. The chart is really cool to see. We can yeah, I guess hopefully I don't know pull we, that up on YouTube. I don't know if we have the right to use this to. chart. Yeah, like <laughs> that might not be allowed. Yeah. But you're gonna have to go look at the study yourself. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll link the study or at least one of the reviews of the study on YouTube and on the podcast, but it's like, for example, for glute max, the highest peak muscle force producing exercise was a split squat, which we watched the video and it's essentially like a lunge squat. It looks mm-hmm. like the person is doing kind of a lunge. That was the highest of 12 the 12. Rep max. Yeah. Doing a 12 rep max. So, so holding some sort of weight. Doing it loaded. Doing, a, doing it loaded. And as far as EMG activity went, that ranked eighth out of all the exercises. So that one alone shows that the one that produced the highest peak muscle force was eighth in EMG activity. That kind of changes everything, every previous thought we had about using EMG activity to equate at all to the actual muscle force that's being produced. Right. It's pretty crazy when you do look at this chart, I mean, the lines and just like where everything is going to realize that it just doesn't match up. And so we have to take a better look at like, okay, let's look at the force of what's actually being produced between the glute max and glute med 
in order to be able to better predict what's going to help when it comes to strength and hypertrophy. Now, when they used more advanced mixed models that accounted for individual participants and specific exercises, the relationship improved a lot. So in that scenario, EMG explained about 80 to 85% of peak muscle force, and that suggests that EMG might be useful for comparing similar exercises with the same person, but once you start comparing across different people or different movement patterns, it's really unreliable. And I think that's like one of the main things to kind of look at when you're looking at EMG. Because most EMG studies are not just done on a single person, they're using right. like a you know, much larger sample size than one. And it makes more sense to me that it's more reliable on one person because again, you place the nodes once and then they're there. Mm -hmm. So even if they're not directly in the exact right spot, it's still going to be more consistent within that one person versus then comparing how accurately did you place these EMGs on 50 people or 100 people or in this study, 14 people. You know, or in we, just the nuances and differences in body. Yeah, we noticed the variability just in the 14 people. And why is this important? Again, <laughs> why would we want to look at peak, peak muscle force versus EMG and what are some of the takeaways? What's your goal? Is your goal to gain the highest amount of strength and get hypertrophy in those booty muscles? Great. Then you're going to want to focus for sure on the ones on the top of the list for peak muscle force. And the moment you've all been waiting for, the five <laughs> top exercises that they studied for glute max peak muscle force were the split squat, like mentioned, the single leg well, RDL. Well, I think we have to say that these are 12 rep max. Yeah. So these are loaded, loaded split squat, loaded single leg RDL, loaded single leg hip thrust, body weight split squat, and a loaded single leg squat. Those were the top five. Would you like the honors of doing the top five? For glute med. For glute med. Well, it is not a side clam. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. They didn't even list. They didn't even do the study side, side clam. They did the side lying leg raise though. That's a shame. And the side lying leg raise was number one for the EMG, but the side lying leg raise was <laughs> way down the list. The ninth? Ninth for the peak muscle force. So if you're really trying to work that side booty muscle, start with a side plank. Just number a one. side plank is number one, body weight side plank. Then we have a single leg RDL, loaded, loaded single leg RDL, a loaded hip hike. So literally just you know pressing that leg down to lift that hip up, the opposite hip up, a single, a loaded single leg squat, and then finally the banded side step loaded. Yeah. I was just doing those the other day. Yes, but that was number five on the list. So again, and and this is where rehab and trying to activate that muscle and get and target that muscle should be essentially the same as gaining strength and hypertrophy in that muscle. Well, and here's where I might disagree slightly with that comment is that some of these exercises for people who are in early rehab would be tough. Doing a 12 sure. rep max split squat is not going to be easy for somebody who's in initial rehab of their knee, hip, or low back. And so that's where taking a slightly different look at maybe some of the exercises that are high on the EMG side, like the side lying leg raise, that's going to be a much lower bar exercise for someone to start, which is where it still has a place. It doesn't mean we are throwing out every other exercise on this list, like the hip hike, body weight hip hike for glute med. That's something we give a ton of people, but mm -hmm. it was 12th on the list here for peak muscle force. So there's going to be a place for all these exercises, depending what area you are at in your overall rehab. If you're looking at performance optimization, then yes, we are probably looking at incorporating a lot more of the exercises on peak muscle force side. If you're in early rehab and do have still have some pain or limitations, then we might need to look other places on the list or incorporate other exercises that are more appropriate. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope that you learned a little bit. What exercises are you going to consider adding in, possibly taking out, or just readjusting how you're thinking about these glute muscles? Was this helpful? And if you have other topics in mind, even if it sounds ridiculous, drop it below. What do you want to hear about? What do you want to learn about? We want to help you understand the research and understand what's best for your body.